I am proud and honored to be here with all of you today. If you want to be heard and listened to, you must continue. You must talk to people. Is it comfortable? No. We came to Washington State during an outbreak of measles, a highly contagious and potentially life-threatening disease. How many of you here are worried about autism? How many of you are worried about seizures, autoimmune disease, I don't have enough arms. brain damage, yes. and death? Yes. We are not living in alternative realities. This is our reality, life with vaccine injury. This was one of more than 20 states with confirmed cases of measles across the U.S. At more than 800 cases so far, 2019 has already broken a 25-year record. The Department of Health will take it upon themselves to make the ultimate decision of whether a child should be vaccinated or not. That's insane. These protesters are against a change in the law that would make it harder for parents to opt out of vaccines for their children. Make a promise to yourself that you will start talking and not be afraid beyond social media. You have to talk to your church members. You have to talk to your neighbors. At the heart of this crisis, is a fear and belief that the measles vaccine is dangerous, a claim that's been repeatedly disproved by the medical community. We have overwhelming evidence showing there's absolutely no link between vaccines and autism. Measles is a leading cause of death in children worldwide, and multiple countries are currently battling outbreaks. The disease was declared eliminated in the U.S. in the year 2000. In this episode of Fault Lines, we look at what's behind its return. Now, if a parent tries to download any healthcare information about vaccines, overwhelmingly they'll download vaccine misinformation. The first thing we have to do is figure out a way to dismantle the media empire. This was all preventable. I mean, measles is a vaccine preventable disease and we shouldn't be seeing it. This is no longer about vaccines. This is a civil rights matter. We are done. We are done. We are done. We are done. <laughs> to understand how Washington State ended up with one of the largest measles outbreaks this year, look no further than the State House in the capital, Olympia. In late March, state lawmakers held a hearing to discuss doing away with an exemption that allows parents to decline the measles vaccine for philosophical reasons. While the vast majority of families in the state choose to vaccinate, Washington is home to two of the least vaccinated cities in the country, in part because of these exemptions. Doors to the Capitol open at 7 a.m. here this morning. Those already aligned down the sidewalk. This room filled up immediately. We're told there's three overflow rooms with at least 800 people, all of them opposed to vaccines, as far as we can tell. Those who are most at risk of getting measles are children who are unvaccinated, either because of their parents' decision or because they're immunocompromised and can't. The elderly are also at risk. As are babies who are too young to get the measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR vaccine, which is typically given in two doses starting at 12 months. My daughter-in-law is pregnant, and she's concerned about going into public. She's concerned about her friends who may bring over children who are unimmunized. It's, it's a real concern for those who are at most risk, and that includes those infants. Faced with more than 70 confirmed measles cases, Washington declared a state of emergency in January and mobilized a response that cost more than a million dollars. It's because of this work that the outbreak wasn't much worse, but it shouldn't take the outbreak of a potentially deadly disease to encourage people to obtain a safe and effective vaccination to protect themselves, their families, our schools, and our community. Outside the hearing, vaccine opponents continued to make their case. You basically walk in there blinding, thinking that you're getting this wonderful thing that's going to make your kid healthy, and then when the system fails you, you feel betrayed. Yes. And that's how I feel. I feel betrayed, and I think many of us are here because we feel betrayed. Yes. Yes. Lydia says her son changed after he received his first set of vaccinations. 
he did he stopped breastfeeding he would not breastfeed anymore he was not interested in looking up at me like he used to before and the babies don't really make much eye contact but still he would like look around move his eyes i saw him just staring at one point and i didn't put the two and two together but i knew that something happened to my child and i didn't understand what it was so on day three he was screaming day and night screaming bloody murder like somebody's killing him it was terrible so i started questioning my doctor i said what is in this vaccine did any doctor uh, ever confirm it was like, from the vaccines what, what happened to your son so uh basically after i took him into the doctor they, they they didn't want to admit that it was from a vaccine. No, I don't feel like they did. They were trying to say that it could be an allergy. And I was scared and because of my faith, I prayed. And that's why I think he's here today and he's normal. He's not autistic or anything. Talking to vaccine opponents for this story, it becomes clear that there's a deep well of terrifying but unverifiable anecdotes, often found and spread online. And now they want to take our medical rights away. So they want to tell us what to put in our bodies. There are stories of people getting euthanized that are mentally ill. I mean, where is the fine line? Where do you hear stories like that? Online. Yeah. Yeah, mostly online. Are there like certain sources you go to for, for uh, that kind of information? So there's like newsletters I'm signed up to mm -hmm. get. Um, and also uh, YouTube videos. I mean, there's a lot of information if you just dig. <laughs> I don't have time to dig, but I have people that send me this stuff. Did you consider vaccinating your three-year-old? Never, never again. Not for me, not for him, not for anybody. Lydia and her family were living in California when the state tightened its vaccination laws. So they decided to move to Washington. Now that Washington is taking away the MMR philosophical exemption, they may be looking for a new home again. It's scary for a family like my family. I was even talking with my husband, and I said, well, if, if these laws are going to come to play, let's go somewhere else. You know, we don't have to stay in this country, even though we love this country. I've been here for 30 years, but I love my kids more than I love this country. Before the outbreak, had you ever seen measles here? In the United States? No. Mm -mm. It was eradicated. It's... Well, it was eradicated. Yeah, now they kind of come back and come back with you know, more and more numbers per year. Is there causation between the movement to not vaccinate mm -hmm. children and the return of measles? Oh, absolutely, of course. There is a lot of uh, misinformation online. There is a strong push, especially people who want their two minutes publicity, you know, like who talk mean things about, like loud, mean, angry things, uh, and a lot of lies, just plain lies. Dr. Tetiana Oderich runs a family practice in Clark County, Washington, the epicenter of the outbreak. She believes that vaccinations have been so effective that they've become a victim of their own success. People didn't see those diseases. They don't know how they look. They think it's harmless. Uh, and the proof of that is, as soon as measles appeared, people massively began vaccinating, massively. You know, five times increase of the vaccination rate. Do they trust you as a doctor? Not all of them, obviously. I mean, that's very interesting. When child is sick, they trust me. Yeah. But when child is healthy, they don't. Public health officials suspect that the Clark County measles outbreak began after an infected child visited from Ukraine, where there's also an outbreak. As the disease spread, officials launched a massive investigation, interviewing more than 4,000 people who might have been exposed. And they identified more than 50 exposure sites, including schools, grocery stores, and restaurants. This Dollar Tree store was an exposure site. That Trader Joe's, that Urgent Health Center, that store over there, Fred Myers, was an exposure site. County officials also jumped online since the internet is often where skepticism about vaccines begins. We didn't want to get into social media wars with commenters and going back and forth, but we wanted to make sure that the really egregious misinformation was countered and that we did answer questions so that people who had legitimate fear or concerns or you know had doubts were seeing that we were responding and at least knew that there was another 
side to this false argument they were hearing. The whole thing you have up there says there's no studies that link autism mm -hmm. to the MMR shot. Mm -hmm. First comment, no studies, question mark, except these 30 peer-reviewed links to autism. But this is a hep B vaccination in this top one. Mm -hmm. Again, it goes back to that kind of pieces of truth. I know I've seen even some where they would link the things, but it would say, like the conclusion of the study would be like, but this was such a small, you know, population, we can't draw any definite conclusions to this, more research needs to be done, but people wouldn't read that part or wouldn't include that part. We tried to respond without, um, without getting sucked to. So the, res the response here is vaccines do not cause autism. That misinformation has been thoroughly and repeatedly debunked. But if I'm a parent, how do I know it's been, like where can I, yeah. where this other guy's given me all these links yeah. and these doctors and these studies. We had had other posts where we would, um, you know, link to vaccine safety information. Another thing we would run into is commenters repeatedly posting the same thing over and over and over on every single, you know, they'd go back for the last two weeks and post the same comment over and over and over. It can very easily overwhelm. The misinformation that we're seeing on social media is not just about the vaccine, it's about measles itself. It is exquisitely contagious. Um, if you have measles and you're with a bunch of folks who are susceptible, for example, not immunized, nine out of 10 of them will get infected. It's airborne and it can stay in the environment for a while. The early symptoms are runny nose, cough, conjunctivitis, which is a pink eye, red or red eye, and fever. After a few days, you develop a rash um, that starts on the head and goes down to the uh, rest of the body. It's not a benign disease. Before we had measles vaccination in the United States, we had 400 to 500 deaths every year from measles in the United States. Why are we so focused on measles? 153 people there have measles. Yeah, right? but... And but, it lasts in the air because it's so... So let's uh, how many pieces of hand, foot, and mouth, and strep, or mono, yeah, or but, like there's uh, so many other infections. Why are we just honed in on measles. Right. If, we, if the immunocompromised, mm -hmm. or if it's that deadly for them, they would be worried about the common cold too. We're not saying that vaccines are the only cause of autism. We've got a lot of toxins in this world that are impacting our children, that are genetically or otherwise susceptible to something. How do you sort through the disinformation out there to figure out what is true? Uh, for me, as a mother, I, I'd say a lot of it was just my gut intuition of knowing something wasn't right. The defense of vaccines uh, in this country falls just to a handful of academic scientists and pediatricians. And we're totally outgunned by this incredible media juggernaut that's become the anti-vaccine uh, movement. Dr. Hotez is a vaccine researcher, pediatrician, and infectious disease specialist. He's also the parent of a child with autism, which led him to write the book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism to counter the myth that vaccines cause autism. We have now 99 genes that have been linked to autism, all involved in early fetal brain development, but the full clinical expression is often not manifest until one between one and three years of age. But you see, that takes time to explain. It's not a quick sound bite, and it's very important, hard to get that information. Because one of the things the anti-vaccine lobby does is they keep moving the goalposts. Uh, right at first they said it was the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and the scientific community responded with large studies of hundreds of thousands of children showing there's no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. So what we've been doing now is playing this kind of uh, glo vaccine or global health whack-a-mole game where you knock one down, another one pops up. So do you still believe that autism can be caused by the MMR shot? Yes, I do. So Dale Bigtree, a former daytime TV producer, is one of the leading voices of the anti-vaccine movement. He hosts a weekly internet show that focuses just on this issue. In 2016, he produced a documentary called Vaxxed that was directed by and heavily features Andrew Wakefield. The CDC had known all along there was this MMR autism risk. Wakefield was the main author of a fraudulent study linking the MMR vaccine to autism. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. The study has since been widely debunked, and Wakefield was stripped of his medical license. 
but not before sparking an anti-vax movement online. Amazon pulled Vax off of its video streaming platform after pressure from doctors groups, public health advocates, and at least one member of Congress. But here's the problem. They're gonna try and make it so that I can't tell you about it on Facebook. This is, what is what number show is this, 105? Are we on 105 right now? When so he talks about vaccines, Big Tree often brings up something called VAERS. It's a program run by the U.S. government where anyone can report any adverse reaction after being vaccinated. And I said, yeah, when we go to the VAERS database, this is Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. This is the only system that we have in America where you report vaccine injuries. So in 2018 alone, the VAERS reports had over 58,000 reported vaccine injuries, over 400 reported vaccine deaths in the United States alone in one year alone. The numbers, the way you're using them, though, it it's explicitly warns against using them that way. Yeah. You're yeah. saying that there are 412 deaths last year. I know. What I'm saying is there's 412 reported deaths. I've never said there were 412 so, confirmed so deaths. So some of those reported. causes of death on VAERS, yeah. one was a drowning, sure. one was from co-sleeping, one was a pre-existing heart condition. The There's no, because the death is reported in VAERS, there's no sure. way to show causation okay. to the vaccine. But in watching your speech and watching your show, man, you would come away thinking 400 people died from vaccines last year. Okay. And then I, I can start to see okay. where they get the number. And then I go to the source and the source says, don't use the number that way. In 2016, Big Tree founded the Informed Consent Action Network, a nonprofit dedicated to investigating vaccines. In its most recent tax filings, ICANN took in contributions of nearly one and a half million dollars. So you're a journalist. Yes. But you're CEO of a company that has a position on the only issue that I think you're actually a journalist on. Right now. Is that yeah. a conflict of, of interest? What? One can't be a journalist and be CEO of a company that like has a side on an issue. Our side on the issue is the Informed Consent Action Network. We seek to eradicate man-made disease. And so the, the, the nonprofit So you can do that or you can places. do journalism, but you can't, do, you can't be both. I, I don't even, I'll be honest with you. I'm simply finding the information as I find it. Big Tree has been touring the country, giving speeches to cheering crowds of vaccine opponents, like this one in Austin, Texas in March. He stirred controversy after he wore a yellow star similar to what Nazis forced Jews to wear during World War II. To compare a New York County's ban on unvaccinated children in public spaces to Nazi treatment of Jews. My God is not the pharmaceutical industry. My God is not the snake wrapped around that bridge on every hospital in America. This is now become a very well organized, very powerful, very dangerous uh, anti-science movement uh, in the United States. Yeah, I believe it is a movement. In fact, I think it's probably one of the fastest growing mo movements in the world. The movement is finding a foothold in Texas where activists are trying to loosen vaccine laws. We've taken those social media warriors, we've taken those, I think we call them keyboard warriors that are there, and we've gotten them to the Capitol, and we've trained them, and we've gotten them in front of their legislators. In 2015, Jackie Schlegel founded Texans for Vaccine Choice, a political action committee focused on opposing required vaccines. She says they lobby state legislators here weekly and their success has become a model for other states. Every single day our phone rings with people in other states wanting to know how we organized and how we became so effective. And I don't know if there's any secret other than you just show up and you learn the ropes and you get it done. Not content with just lobbying, they're now putting up candidates for elections who are opposed to required vaccinations. Even though Texas already has some of the most lenient vaccination laws in the country. From a public health perspective, though, and we've interviewed a lot of state public health officials, their job is to prevent breakouts, not wait for a breakout to happen. But there's a fine line where they say, okay, you can still make your choice for your child, they just can't be a part of this. My child or any of the other children who could potentially be opting out of the vaccines, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a disease they can share. They formed their pack, they started showing up at the Capitol, and after that legislative session, we realized that the one voice that was missing that was really important was the voice of the regular everyday person. 
Jenny Sue founded a group called Immunize Texas, in a rare case where parents have come together to politically organize in support of vaccines to address what she says is an alarming drop in immunization rates across the state. The most common story for someone that supports vaccines is I vaccinated my kid and nothing happened. And it's not that compelling, but it's important. And people have had enough. I think now that we're seeing things like measles come back, we're seeing whooping cough, mumps on the rise, people are starting to wake up and say, you know what, enough is enough, it's gone too far. This situation is crazy and we need to, we need to rein it back in. Like many people we met during the reporting of this story, Sue became aware of this issue soon after having her first child. I went into Facebook groups. I tried to join, you know, various moms groups. And that's when I started to realize that there are people who choose not to vaccinate living in our communities. And at that time, back in 2012, the sentiment was that you weren't supposed to judge them. I look at the mothers and I don't want to invalidate their anxiety about their child. And, no, I and feel the, the very, shot. I feel a lot of empathy for them. Mm -hmm. And if you're a vaccine hesitant, I understand. I mean, if you don't have a training in biology or medicine and you see some of this stuff on Facebook or the internet, it sounds scary. And if especially you're dealing with a diagnosis that maybe doesn't have treatment or a cure or even really a known cause, I can understand why you're looking for an answer. And if everyone's telling you it's vaccines, after a while, it sounds true. For me, it's really the activists that are the problem. They take facts, they twist them, they don't, they don't share the whole story, they um, sometimes just tell blatant lies. Texas has, I think, some of the lowest vaccination rates. There are some cases of measles in Texas, but it's not really, they're, they're not connecting the dots into full-blown um, right. outbreaks. What's happening there? It's only a matter of time. The situation we have in Texas is very dire. We have, uh, according to the Texas Department of Health, we have 60,000 uh, kids not getting their vaccines in the state of Texas. And those are the ones we know about. Uh, these are highly vulnerable communities now, and we should have every reason to believe that a big measles uh, epidemic is coming. If that happens, children like four-year-old Juliana Graves, who lives outside of Houston, Texas, will be at risk. It's very much a life or death issue. If she contracted uh, chicken pox, if she contracted measles, if she contracted the flu, if she contracted mumps, those are all life-threatening uh, diseases to Juliana. Right after she was born, Juliana had a heart transplant. And since then, she's been on medication that's left her immunocompromised. That means she can't receive live virus vaccines like MMR or rotavirus. She looks like she's a normal child, but she's not. We already had two hospital stays this year, and it's just barely April. And one of them was from a vaccine preventable disease that she's not able to be vaccinated against. What was it? Rotavirus. How did she get rotavirus? I have no from? idea. I have no idea. We, I mean, she could have gotten it from the grocery store. She could have gotten it um, from a park. I mean, I try to keep her away from certain things, but I can't, she can't live in a bubble. And that's why we live close to our hospital. I had to rush her down to the hospital um, a week ago. A week ago today, I was in my car driving as fast as I could to get to the emergency center. And she was in the trauma shock room. Mommy, are we going to go get our food? Yes, we're going to go get our food. And then can we get cupcakes? Yeah. <gasps> Juliana will begin public school next year. And Ricky's nervous about the other children she'll be exposed to on a daily basis. It's the same school that my son goes to. And I have to make sure that I know that school is at least 95% vaccinated or else she can't go to school there. Have you been able to get the vaccination numbers for that school? Not recently, no. Now, what do you say to the mom who's going to be in the kindergarten class here who chooses to not vaccinate? I just feel really sorry for their child in case they get a disease that's really painful or harmful where they can't breathe. I would tell her about my experience with Juliana being in the ICU and how terrible it was and how she was on a breathing tube and how I would never hope for that for her child. Mm -hmm. And um, try to see if they might look at the research and change their mind. It breaks my heart that I even have to do this to protect my daughter. Life is hard enough 
for us and most of the parents that I know that have healthy children, it's stressful and hard enough that we shouldn't have to worry about any kind of public health issue living in the United States of America.